All right. It's Sunday, 11.30 a.m., March 22nd, and we're here to do another equities wrap-up and outlook for the week ahead. And I'm here with Fassel, our equities analyst over here. And for those of you who are not familiar with Fassel, he is a day trader in the equities markets. His specialty is the options market. And uh, he provides us daily updates on how the markets are doing. So Fassel, that being said, you want to tell us uh, how Friday went and uh, what you're looking forward to the week ahead? Yeah, no problem. Um, first of all, good to be here. Good to hear from you. Um, it was such a crazy week this week, and I think we were kind of tiptoeing up until Friday on how we wanted to feel about the stimulus packages and, and the way that uh, the government was reacting to the coronavirus spread. I think the market is looking for any good news to kind of rally off of, and just, you know, it seems like every day we're not getting anything to go off of, even, even you know, though the Fed is, is pumping in all this money and everything, it's, it's not enough, clearly. Uh, they're going to continuously have to do more as the weeks go on and this virus spreads. Um, it's very, very tough to gauge this market, but Friday gave us some really clear signals in the morning that showed us, okay, we, even though we may be forming a sort of short-term bottom technically, it doesn't look like it's going to hold up because you didn't see the leadership stocks like Apple, um, Microsoft. I think Amazon was maybe one of the, no, actually, no, even Amazon was not able to, to uh, gain really strong momentum in order to break my short-term resistance levels. Like, I don't know if there was any stock that kind of broke it. Uh, maybe Uber or, or JD that, that remains to be seen, but, None of them showed any strength in the opening. And then as you saw later on, I mean, I was kind of talking about it through the discord about Apple. Apple was acting extremely surprising considering in the morning, we actually got an upgrade for the stock and the stock actually jumped up in the pre-market about um, 10 points to 258. And that was right above my 257 level, level that I was watching to tell me, okay, if they're buying up Apple, Apple still has significant risk here, but they are seeing a bounce up in China. There is some positive real catalyst you can go off of. So I'm expecting it to at least break, break some minute resistance level and hold above there to tell me people are, are using maybe the China recovery as a catalyst to buy into the market. And that's why you're seeing the short term short-term bottom could be permanent i didn't really know until friday but um after seeing everything play out apple was not going along with with the market swings in the morning it was staying very tight you had a lot of key stocks you know perform really well in the market morning going up with the market as the market went up 500 600 points but apple maintained below yesterday's or i'm sorry thursday's res resistance level which was key and you have yeah. to remember when a stock has an upgrade, that really should be a positive catalyst, especially a stock like Apple during this time. You really want to see it outperform and break the resistance levels when it has that type of catalyst. And you just didn't see that. And then when you look across the board, Amazon, Amazon's one of the key companies that's going to be, you know, at least benefit, probably the most benefited company in this stage because they're going to have to be the ones delivering the goods. So they didn't even perform well. They opened up high and, and completely, completely took out all their gains. Same thing with Walmart. Walmart has been another leader. It made an all-time high two days ago, I believe. It's been very, very mm -hmm. strong. And to see it pull back below its breakout level was another key sign that, oh, damn. Okay, I don't, it doesn't look like anything is garnishing support right now. Um, lastly, you could look at um, kind of my newest leader, to, to my leadership list, uh, Clorox. Clorox has been a, a CLX, yeah. Clorox has been such a fantastic company recently because uh, as people have rushed to, to the supermarkets, these products have been in, in such high demand. Um, so Clorox has, had really showed a lack of momentum throughout the day and just continued to sell off. It's still above its breakout point, which I expected to do much better than the rest of the stock, the stocks, as well as the entire consumer defensive sector. But just bottom line, across the board, 
you didn't see any good thing happen and, and you really should have seen it considering the market was at a short term bottom. Right, right. Oh, definitely. And I think your um uh the IWM uh e the ETF, this one was also, you know, something that I was looking at uh where was it? This was the bottom that I had pegged that hey, maybe we can start getting a bounce. So this was the bottom that we put in in 2016. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're basically sitting on that support. Like this is kind of like a you know, make it <laughs> or or die essentially. Yeah. Kind of scenario. Um, and, and I think this is kind of the case if you if you just look across the board, whether it's you know the Dow Jones index, IWM, S P five hundred, I mean, you know, they've they've already hit significant support levels from 2018, some back in 2016. And now it's just like, holy crap, like we've taken out every single support and now it just looks like everything just might be in free fall, you know. Totally agree. And, you know, this, this may be indicative of what type of event we're in because we've never had something where uh, an event like this could cause everything to stop. So, for instance, a company may not have any earnings like United. They may not have any earnings for the entire two quarters, three quarters. So how does that affect? Like, even, even during the recession, people were still having to, to fly and travel and you were able to get on a plane and travel if you needed to. So even though the earnings were, were low, it's not like they're, they're being pegged to be nothing. Right. So it's really affecting the volatility, the short-term spike downs. And it continues to be something that, that is such a challenge to price into the market. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. And I think um, I had just uh, messaged you uh, just a few days back that I think it was survey USA in, um, or as a Gallup poll or something, they, they did a, uh, uh, data, uh, consensus data update. And they were talking about how 9% of working Americans, which is about 14 million people so far have been laid off as a result of coronavirus. One in four workers have had their hours reduced. Um, 2% have been fired. 20% have had their po uh, business trips postponed or projects canceled. So what we're really seeing is, you know, now finally the beginning impacts and the ripple in the uh, American economy. And the rest of the world is also starting to feel this. You know, I was actually just talking to one of my friends in uh, Zambia, and he said that, um, what is it, the Quacha. Whoa. Uh, it's 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 like their currency. I forgot how you spell it. I don't know if that's actually on the forex uh, market actually, but if you compare it to the rand, right, the South African rand, which is pretty close to the kwacha, because Zambia and South Africa are right near each other, and similar economic structures as well, um, you know, these currencies against the dollar are really starting to see the weakness because global economies, if the U.S. is being impacted, you know, you can be damn sure that these impact uh, these economies across the world, which say depend heavily on tourism, heavily on oil, such as, you know, Colombia or Argentina or Venezuela, they're starting to see the ripple effects in their economy. And as the dollar gains strength, their own local currency gets, you know, significantly devalued, right? Um, mm -hmm. So the ripple effects around the world are starting to be seen. And especially now in America, with the numbers that I just told you, I mean, I don't see an end to um, this virus unless America itself goes on a lockdown as well. Like, uh, unless we want to face what Italy is facing, which we're already, you know, in that same trajectory where they have like, uh, I think like four or 5,000 deaths already. Um, Iran has somewhere close to like 16 or 1800 deaths. So it's almost not even a, you know, if it's going to happen, it's when is it going to happen for the U S Oh, I totally agree. Like if you're someone who is thinking the U.S. will not go into lockdown, I mean, I don't know what to tell you at this point. I think New York just came out today and said they had more cases just in New York State than South Korea or France. And I mean, wow. this, is just, this is just the beginning. So if you really are thinking we are not going, the best case scenario, in my opinion, we should have been in lockdown already. We should go in lockdown like ASAP for at least a, two weeks to a month and, and stop this spread. I think there are still some people 
who who take this thing way too lightly. Like I still talk to some people, some of my friends, and they're like, this is still kind of like the flu to us. It, and I'm like, yeah. what are you talking about? Right. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, people like people are dying in Italy. Like just look at Italy as a as a use case. And yeah. I mean, they're just they're wishing that they would have gone in lockdown sooner. And yeah. I I think I don't know if it's the American attitude or or the Southern attitude, but it still hasn't reached that point of fear to where everyone is on board with lockdown. And I think until it reaches that, you will continue to see this virus spread, you know, at, at, at very subliminal levels because the testing isn't even there to, to get it properly. Right. Um, so yeah, we have a lot more to, to play out. I just really hope we go into lockdown soon and just, just start it like ASAP. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, every day that we sort of delay, uh, a lockdown or, you know, significant um, social distance, uh, distancing, you know, methods to be able to separate people. It's more deaths that you're almost, you know, um, undoubtedly going to have, right? It's like I said, it's really not a question of if it's, you know, when, right? Mm -hmm. And so Italy went into a lockdown two weeks ago, and they're still having, you know, obviously significant uh, higher rates of infection and deaths. And the U.S. is now starting to see that parabolic cycle of, you know, infection starting to ramp up, deaths starting to ramp up. I was just listening to um, a, uh, a uh, phone call between a doctor in the U.K. and a journalist, and he was just saying that it is so overwhelming to deal with all these patients. Uh, and he said that if you think that this is anywhere close to the flu, you know, as a doctor, I don't know what to tell you because you're beyond helping. Um, we are dealing with like a crisis, like, uh, you know, and obviously a crisis at a, a global stage, you know, and yeah. the countries that are not going to take this seriously. So for example, in my opinion, America is yeah, somewhat taking it seriously, but we're not in lockdown stage. We don't even have the test kits available for, you know, the, the amount of population that we have. We have the current administration telling us that if you don't feel the symptoms, don't get tested. That's like the dumbest thing because the one thing that we know about coronavirus is it doesn't even show symptoms till 14 days later, uh -huh. you know? So like by the time you are walking around and infecting at least, you know, five, 10, hundred people that you come across, okay, then they carry that and they in infect another, you know, five, 10, hundred people. And it's just a big ripple effect that you start seeing. So it doesn't seem like we're taking this that seriously as we should. I totally agree. I, I just, I really wish that there was some way to, to just start the lockdown now, because I think that's the most effective way to stop the spread. Um, and, and until we do that, it's, it just feels like people will not take it seriously until the government says everything is closed, at least in, in my opinion and in my perspective. So as long as these people continue to think it's not a big deal and believe me there's a ton of them still like yeah. you'd be surprised even though you see all these deaths around the globe there are people who do not like to believe news reports who think news heavily exaggerates a lot and, and in some cases the news does yeah. but i mean for this situation it's like man i get a grip i mean i can't tell you enough how how much worse this thing can get i know i know so um <laughs> now that we've scared our, our viewers into uh, believing the coronavirus is scary. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you didn't already well, know. <laughs> if you didn't already know, in case you're living under a rock. Um, <laughs> let's, so let's talk about the markets, right? I mean, here we are you know, on the brink of recession, right? I think it's almost an undeniable truth right now that we're either in a recession or we're you know, forecasted to be in a recession because J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, um, uh, Goldman Sachs have already stated that we should have almost at least, you know, a contraction in the economy of almost 20% over the next, you know, two quarters or so. Okay. Uh, and that's, you know, the, the bigger players in the market who aren't usually out there just, you know, throwing bad news out there. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually they t typically have an optimistic view on things, but I think they're now starting to get the grip of reality of how this is impacting um, uh, the American economy and the world overall. So with that being said, you know, the Federal Reserve just recently said 
that they're going to start lending about a trillion dollars a day to the large banks. Now, you know, I, I would say I'm a bit more uh, fiscally and you know, monetarily a bit more uh, conservative in a sense because I'm of the opinion that you know, if you really believe in capitalism, if you really believe in the free market, then why would you not let the free market play itself out, right? Why are you trying to bail out these industries or you know, even some of the, um, uh, the companies who are negatively impacted, but you know their stocks were already heavily overvalued. They put their money into buybacks, you know, months ago, okay, or almost the last year or two, when the interest rates were cheap, when the money was still being printed. So they clearly didn't prepare for any of the situation. So now it's up to the American people and the taxpayers and the government to bail them out. I just, you know, it seems like corporate welfare, right? We talk about never you know having to bail out the individual but now we're here bailing out the very people who are degenerates in, you know in in any sense of the word right yeah i mean degenerate is kind of <laughs> that's kind of hard <laughs> no i i totally get you i but i can't i mean we can sit here today and say look this event clearly showed us that there is a real flaw with having a heavily over leveraged uh, economic system, especially when you when you're kind of greedy for growth. Growth can can manifest so fast in, in today's world with the internet and how the way things are connected. I get why you would want to take out loan and and you know not grow through traditional cash and and really expand growth to a to an extraordinary level. I get it, um, but I just I feel like it was very tough to to kind of gauge an event like this and how it would affect literally the lives of every single every single person because the lockdown i don't think anyone last year could have ever predicted that if we had a disease this year that we would end up be, being in a lockdown state the way we are today um i get that these guys bought back so many shares and and considering they had so much leverage they still have so much leverage they didn't use that to, to pay down their debt yeah. i think was really stupid um, but bottom line, you just can't let these guys fail first and foremost, at least for the airlines, because they are a necessity. And I think the U S while, while you're right about if, if capitalism really works, the free market really works, you know, let it play out. I still think the U S cares more about dominance and maintaining dominance in, in necessary industries like airlines. I don't even know about cruise. I don't know how necessary cruises are. They're a little riskier than airlines, but I think airlines and definitely small businesses are going to get uh, some of the first bailouts. I think, I think definitely movie theaters, I think they will definitely be one of the first industries to get cut. Like, even though I don't know how many they employ, how many people they employ today. There are a ton of movie theaters across the board, small yeah. and large. They're, they're probably going to get destroyed. And I really don't think they'll receive a bailout considering I think uh, I think some people are using this to to the advantage like the studios. I yeah. think that the trend that we've been seeing over the past four or five years as far as if you're a middleman, if you're not making the content, you are at risk. And so I think these studios like Disney, Comcast, Un uh, and Universal is part of Comcast, but uh, Disney and Comcast, they're looking at these movie theaters and saying, why do we even have to release them to you? Why do we even have to share any profit with you? We could just do some direct to sale. And, and you've started to see it with this quarter, I think Trolls 2, Disney said, we are not gonna release it in theaters. It's going straight to, to um, you know, be able to buy for $20 and then there'll be like a two month period and then it'll come on streaming services or, or be available for DVD or whatever. Yeah. But I think you will definitely see that shift start to take hold and companies like Disney and Comcast will go to the, the administration and say, look, you got to let these guys go because it's just, it, it was all part of the overall trend. And, um, you know, maybe they could make a case for making up for it in, in job loss or, or whatever, but I just think there will be industries that will end up, you know, tanking like, like the, like the movie theater industry or, even the cruise line industry, I think that's kind of tough to see because they're so huge, but they're so leveraged. Um, it, it's really going to be a lot to to kind of pay off that debt. Like, when are you ever going to pay off that debt? 
you're not mm-hmm. that heavily a uh, cash generated business. You consistently have to be levered um, from the point you, you start getting the ships out to the sea and, and maintaining them. It's, it's a really big challenge. Um, yeah. I think you will definitely start to see more clarity about which ones fall and which ones survive within the next two weeks for sure. Definitely, definitely. And speaking of levered money, you know, obviously, when we start looking at the the macro markets at large, uh, when we start looking at the S and P five hundred, you know, gold, um, uh, the U S dollar, ten year Treasury notes, and then oil. Uh, obviously, aside from the U S dollar, all of these industries are essentially all of these uh, macro asset classes are levered in some way. Gold, I mean, definitely. Uh, mm-hmm. Ten-year Treasury note to a certain degree, but because it's kind of relying on uh, U.S. printing money, so to yeah. some extent you can say it's levered money. Oil definitely levered. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we're looking at you know say all of these markets, and I uh, showed our um, CryptoSonic users this chart a few days ago, and I said that when you start looking at these macro markets at large and the one thing that sticks out is the DXY, the US dollar going up. That means that what's happening internally is a deleveraging across the board. And what I mean by that is when all these assets are getting uh, sold off, okay, and you're seeing them go negative, um, and you're seeing the dollar go up, that means that everyone is heading for the exit doors meaning people are wanting to go into the true safe haven, which is cash, right? Mm -hmm. And so that kind of creates this ultimate scenario for, you know, what we saw in one of the older movies from like the 50s, uh, It's a Wonderful Life, um, where you may have potential bank runs, right? Mm -hmm. Now, one of our members in Australia, he was just telling us that, you know, some of the ATMs in Australia have already started to, limit people in terms of the cash that they can take out so i know it's a small example but small examples often you know are the uh, leading indicator if you will of what is happening or what could happen on a on a macro level so if we start seeing that okay people are moving from assets and you know uh, investments into cash and then cash itself is heavily in demand and you know, the banks are not able to give people their money back because the banks themselves are also levered, right? It's not like the mm-hmm. banks keep all your freaking money in the bank and they're like, hey, you can take all your money back, you know? That's yeah. not how it works. So it's like the perfect storm in a sense where everything is coming to a culmination point of, oh my God, we're going to be in a recession. Jobs are being lost. We can't even get the economy started because of this fucking virus. Um, and you know, money itself is strapped because the banks themselves don't really have the money. So everything is kind of just coming to this inflection point of, holy crap, like, where are we going to stand, you know, tomorrow, next week, next month as, you know, the, the uh, American economy. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And, and I mean, banks, I'll tell you something, banks are, are, they were healthy. They were much healthier than than they've ever been to deal with the financial crisis. Um, I had a buddy uh, who works at J.P. Morgan, and he was telling me, at this point, no one is really worried right now. And I know that's crazy, but he's yeah. saying we were so extremely healthy. We've we've kind of opted to to call all of our clients and say, hey, we're here to help no matter what, and and here to help to any extent that you need it. So at least for now, I don't know if they can maintain that level of optimism as, as this virus plays out, but um, the banks were very healthy going into it, even though they were levered and even though they do have exposure to a lot of these assets that, that could be going bankrupt. Um, I didn't get the general feel that, that he was scared, but granted, I mean, we are still in the early innings of this thing. I mean, I'll probably ask him within a month how he's feeling. He'll probably have no hair. So, <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't know. I don't even know what to think of it. I don't know how the market will play out. I don't know how these banks will play out. I just know these banks were in a different situation before. They're in a, in a better position to help a lot of these companies and, and definitely work with the government to assist all these companies. But, you know, how much? How much right. will it take? 
Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, and, and speaking of banks, uh, for the people who are watching this right now, this, the stock market decline in the banks itself is not representative of you know the, the struggle internally of banks. Some of these banks uh, might actually be, be doing better than the, the valuation of their stocks because um, I would probably say J.P. Morgan Chase, you know, does a lot better um, in terms of uh, levered money and in terms of lending than mm -hmm. other banks. Like for example, we know uh, the European banks are definitely in a big trouble. Yep. Right. Deutsche Bank, especially, I think you and I have been talking about Deutsche Bank for <laughs> <You> a long <laughs> time. <laughs> the people at Deutsche Bank do not like you. <laughs> <laughs> I've been saying since like last year, I was like, this bank is like destined to fail, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I think it's, I mean, it's already on, you know, basically like a war path to, to keep going down to zero. It's, it's basically <laughs> like, you know, but, but I think Euro itself, I mean, they're already in a situation where they're, in the negative interest rate territory, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, Italy, Italy, Spain, you know, some of the even Nordic countries were already not doing so well, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, uh, this, this is all almost like too good to, you know, have all the cards. It's like the house of cards, like collapsing before your eyes, you know? And I don't know how people could still be in denial of how the economies as we know that, uh, as we know them, are falling apart piece by piece. Now, I don't know how people can like live with themselves when they just say that, well, you know, this is just capitalism and you know, everything will be fine tomorrow. I think that's the scariest part is people just have this rosy picture because we've been in a 10 year bull market that they don't know how to shift from bullish to neutral or bullish to neutral to bearish, you know? And yeah. maybe that is the one thing that's going to catch them off guard because you know, people like my parents, some of, um, you know, uh, my, my friends and their parents, they're already starting to see job losses. They're starting to see their businesses impacted. Their 401ks, their retirement funds were already wiped by almost 40, 50, 60% in some cases, you know? So the, the whole, you know, rosy optimistic picture is now starting to become this dark grim picture for them. And unfortunately for some people, you know, it might be too late, right? It might be too late for them to realize, you know, hey, we're in the middle of a recession. Equities are down another, you know, 20, 30%, like we mentioned. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think there's another side to this type of complacency or, or, or whatever you want to call it. And that people have dealt with, or, or the investing world has dealt with viruses before. And it's continuously thought of as like every virus is kind of the same in that you do go through a dark period, but there is always light at the end of the tunnel. Like a, va a vaccine will come out. People will start going back out again once it's, once it's out. And I think, um, I don't know if, I don't know if this is true, but is it true that this virus is actually going to be seasonal? Like we're going to have to get shots for it every season, like the flu. Uh, I had read something like that on the WHO website or not the WHO, so, some, you know, um, medical field website, but they also said that the virus has a very high tendency to mutate, you know? Yeah. And then I you mean, have to create a whole new vaccine. Exactly. Like, so this was supposedly the, the current virus that we're seeing now is supposedly like a mutation, uh, if I'm not mistaken of the original SARS virus, you know? Mm -hmm. so if it already mutated and we don't even have a cure for something that we partially knew, which was a SARS, you know, imagine something else that is stronger than COVID with a higher mortality rate coming in the next two years or three years while we're just getting through the bumps of, you know, this uh, COVID-19 virus. Exactly. And that's exactly what I'm saying. I don't think people especially in the investing world are grappling with that scenario at all. I think even with the spike down that we've seen, we are not pricing in the fact that we may be dealing with this problem at a much higher, higher severity within the next maybe year or two years. Like exactly like you said, we could come out with a vaccine, but it could mutate. And then it's this problem all over again. Um, right. So I think, it's so tough to gauge it because these investors have been through through extremely tough times and and sure you could say there's light at the end of the tunnel but uh 
the tunnel is very, very far and it's very long. And, you know, there may be pockets of light, but it it looks like we're going to be in the tunnel for, for the foreseeable future until we can come up with, with a way to either stop the mutation. I don't even know if that's possible or, or just a generalized vaccine that's able to, to combat all forms of, of mutation, which I don't even know. I'm not a vaccine specialist, but you know, that would be something that could eliminate the risk because now it looks like there will be a risk of, of this happening at least for the next five years, 10 years. I don't even know. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty much a, a you know, a, a lifelong thing, at least for our generation, in my opinion, because diseases like this will undoubtedly pop up. Right. So it's just mm-hmm. not really a matter of, you know, like if it's going to happen, it's again, a matter of when it's going to happen and what kind of, you know, severity, what, what kind of spread uh, it's going to have. And as the world kind of gets smaller and smaller, more people travel, more people go to different parts of the world, you know, meet others, meet people at other conferences, you know, things like this spread at a much faster rate, Totally. you know? Mm -hmm. And so now we're kind of starting to see the impacts of it on the U S economy. And one thing I wanted to uh, show you this, this is something interesting that I don't know if a lot of people look at, but this is the uh, unemployment search Google, uh, Google search trend that we had um, in the U S for the past 30 days. And you could see just over the last five to seven days, we just saw it ramp up like crazy. <laughs> so this Damn. is obviously indicative of, you know, where the American uh, mindset and sentiment is. People are scared. They're now starting to recognize the economy itself is looking a bit shaky. Um, either they are being affected by unemployment or someone they know is. And you're now starting to see, the, you know, the, the Google search trends um, show that. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Like, I mean, look, even I Googled, you know, some remote jobs. I just wanted to see what type of jobs were popping up. And it's only like Amazon, Walmart, um, where I live, we got a store called HEB. Um, those people are hiring. So if you've probably lost your job, you were in the finance industry or, or definitely if you're in the petroleum industry, you, you're typing unemployment right now and you're probably looking to get into to a bag. Um, it's it's a weird time to live in like if you are working in a grocery store you are a king right now like right definitely i I mean everyone kind of wants your job right now and so you know this is just such a crazy time i think the the point i want to make is once we're done with this if we have to live and 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 kind of operate in an environment where there's a constant risk that a virus, this virus could mutate and end up shutting everything down again. I mean, imagine if we have another shutdown two years down the line or or something like this where it mutates and and causes lockdowns everywhere. Yeah. I mean, how does that bode well for our financial system in general? In my opinion, it, it, it is not optimal. You can't have so much debt. You can't, if you're going to keep capitalism and that will restrict uh, CapEx and the way people invest forever. So I think if, if this thing shows that it starts to, wants to mutate and continuously pops up, I mean, keep an open mind. The American system and the, and the global economy system could forever be changed because of this, because it can't operate with, with lockdowns happening every two, two years for a quarter. Like it just, you just can't have a capitalistic uh, society built on debt like it is now performing in that environment. And so I think people really need to to be aware of that once the recovery starts. And, and that's something I'm kind of keeping an open mind to. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's a great point. And by the way, you mentioned, um, uh, you know, the, the energy industry, right? So when we're starting to look at oil, I mean, oil itself is a big part of major, major economies across the world, especially America. Uh, I had read that, um, the oil industry in America is about accounts for almost 8% of the total overall GDP and almost, I think 9 million jobs in the mm-hmm. U S oil industry. Let's look it up. GDP. I looked this up a little while back, you know, um, let me see. Yeah. So 8% oil and natural gas. Okay. 10.3 million jobs of uh, 8% of the, uh, GDP of America. So 
with, with the impact that we've seen on oil, I mean, undoubtedly, we're going to start seeing job losses in the oil sector, right? Um, mm -hmm. And on top of that, what's worse is because people can't even travel, airlines are shut down, cruise lines are not really moving, oil is being smashed even more, you know? Yeah, and people can't even drive. I mean, like the the average person is not driving as much as as they used to. So that's even contributing to to the decline in, in demand overall. Yeah, yeah, and and natural gas, I mean, same thing, right? Just getting hammered, you know, absolutely crushed. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know, overall, it just seems like. Uh, that the virus itself is like a big wake up call for people across the world, especially in America. I mean, you know, as I've said before, I, I think the virus itself was uh, a, a, um, a needle that pricked the bubble that we were already creating, you know. So whether you want to believe that it was the virus alone that caused all of this, I think we were almost on that path at some point because it's not like the underlying issues of the American economy did not exist before the virus. Of course it did. We were still a heavily over leveraged system. We were still a, a debt ridden society. We were still, you know, uh, uh, on the war path of getting interest rates down to zero. It's not like the virus was the only thing that brought us down to zero. We were already 25 basis points away from 0% interest rates before the virus even, you know, came to its existence. Right. Yeah. Um, I kind of agree with you in that it was the needle to pop the bubble. The, the thing is, I believe we were in a bubble that could inflate for as long as time would let it until we would have an event that caused everything to stop, that caused the entire debt system to say, hey, you got to pay me, even though you're not even open for business. Like it was really this type of event, any type of event that would cause global markets to shut down. Yeah, I mean that that should never happen ever, like if if in this financial system. And I think when it did, sure, that was the thing that that popped the bubble. But I think this type of system could have gone on, you know, for at least the next like twenty, thirty years before if we never had something like this. So that's very it, true. Yeah, but, but it, would you agree that um, we would have smaller? Uh, I guess you could now say recessions and corrections like we did in 2008, 2009, because one could make the argument that even then that was, you know, uh, a, a sort of gross handling of funds and um, blowing the bubble and, you know, mishandling of debt, essentially, right? Because we didn't need a virus back then to, you know, uh, essentially bring the US, U.S. economy to its knees back then. I did. Obviously, it's not as severe as it is right now, but it did happen. Yeah, no, definitely. And, and I think there was a lot of things that went wrong, especially all curtailing to how banks loaned out money and how they handled all their, their mortgage properties and everything. I think they really fueled it. But this is this is just a totally different beast in that it's not even sector related. It is everything across the board on a global scale just shutting down. And, and while you could say, you know, the, the bank's, and, and their mismanagement kind of popped that bubble. I think the the system that we were on from, from the recovery of that, that uh, downturn to now was fine. I think you could say as long as the global economy, the global citizen got wealthier and more people got into the fold of the global economy, um, we could operate within that financial system. It's just now no one is able to participate and it's, it, that's just even worse than anything. So I don't know if it's specifically caused by one factor like like it was in, in 08, 09 with the complete mishandling by the banks. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, that's just my opinion. I, I really think we could have continued to operate for like the next 20, 30 years had we not had an event that caused a complete lockdown. Yeah, yeah. No, I can agree with that because um, I think the way I look at it is Nonetheless, I mean, we, we were still in the bubble blowing phase, right? I mean, there's no doubt that the, the underlying issues of having um, big debt, you know, over levered uh, asset classes across the board was still part of the problem because America itself and possibly, you know, many parts of the world 
do not know how to properly um, manage or grow businesses unless it's heavily levered money. And then usually that levered money comes with a particular risk um, associated with it, which is that you need to know also when to pay off your debt in due time so you don't keep borrowing more levered money to pay off your original debt or keep your business growing. So it's like mm -hmm. a cyclical factor of, okay, I need to borrow you know, money to keep the business growing and to keep my shareholders happy, but then to be able to pay off some of those debts, do I just borrow more money from the system that's already over leveraged? Or do we kind of say, hey, you know, for this quarter, we're gonna start seeing a slowdown in growth and then your shareholders are happy, then your stock tanks. And then it's, it's like, a, <laughs> like a greedy system that almost warrants you know, the, the uh, uh, ability for companies to borrow money and to keep inflating prices. And I think that's my large concern is that I don't even think even after this crisis that we'll learn because I think the human tendency is for as much growth and greed as humanly possible without ever looking back at the consequences of what kind of you know, world are we going to create when this does you know, start crashing, if at it, if it all it does. or I, I mean, it's inevitable that it does. Yeah, no, no I'm definitely curious to see how, how the entire financial system gets laid out. Um, as far as, you know, I think, I think, you know, the kind of trend from what we saw at the bottom of 09 to now, how people view, you know, taking out a loan for growth. I think, I think the reason why so many people were willing to take out a loan, not only because rates were extremely low and, and the government wanted you to take out a loan for growth, but um, there were a lot more avenues to get new customers, whether it's through new advert, online advertising, um, you, like the Facebook effect, uh, how their advertising completely changed small business forever. There were a lot of reasons for people to say, look, I think now is the time to take out a loan. Um, our customer base has pretty much been expanded because now we can sell globally. You know, a lot of these small businesses were only kind of tailored to the areas around them and maybe statewide or whatever, at least in America. And then you have the optimization of the internet, just distribution lines and overall marketing to where you could reach customers anywhere. Your, your total addressable audience just grew exponentially. So I understand why people feel like, you know, you want to take out debt to grow fast because the avenues are there. And I think that's, that was the difference between now and looking back in like 2000 or 2000, you know, before 2008. Um, but, you know, like you said, this thing will completely change the way people view being levered and how that affects the overall American economy and the overall recovery is really something to be, to, to mention, or I'm sorry, something to watch. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we spoke about, you know, how the economy is shaping itself up overall, um, what to look out for in terms of, uh, you know, signs of things potentially getting worse with the virus. Now, I think most of our viewers are probably wondering, okay, well, what does that mean for now? You know, what do I do? So I guess, again, for those of you who are watching, we're not financial advisors, uh, financial advisors, but and I can only tell you how we're looking at the market currently, uh, how we're going to position ourselves over the next, you know, maybe a few weeks, few months. And for the most part, you know, um, Fassel, I, I, I don't know, I guess, uh, I've personally been in mostly cash. Have you? Uh, no, I, uh, I took a shot on Uber and JD earlier this week and, um, you know, I only like those because those have extremely long uh, growth opportunities that I think could be beneficial in a market where relatively speaking, everything is shutting down, everything is going down. So I, I really thought Uber was a good company considering they would be positioned to handle a lot of the distribution of products. As more and more cities get locked down, um, access and distribution to uh, whether necessities or, or other things becomes restricted. Uber could be that intermediary to help either deliver, you know, Uber Eats obviously delivers food, but I was reading a story that they may even deliver coronavirus test kits. So, oh, wow. yeah, no, so th that's literally what I'm looking for is, is companies that are able to 
not only adapt in this in this marketplace, but able to literally stay open. Um, I think I'm willing to take a shot on stocks that have been killed. I mean, going from 40 to all the way down, to, I think 15 uh, Thursday, that's really pricing in a lot of the negativity as far as people not traveling, people not using their taxi service. I think that was already priced into the stock. And then I, I didn't think they were pricing in enough about how much this company could be involved in, in the new system, the new environment that we're in. So I like to take, I took a shot on Uber. It, it worked out really well. Um, and then JD.com. Uh, it's a Chinese stock. I've mentioned it here a couple times. Um, they're kind of like the Chinese, well, they already have a Chinese Amazon. It's called Alibaba, but they're Alibaba's competitor. And I basically like this stock because China has already recovered. It's held up much better than than the other asset classes, whether you're talking about growth stocks or between emerging market and US-based. Um, for the most part, I think the worst should be should have come through as far as what the Chinese consumer is dealing with. But I specifically think there's an interesting window because we still don't have a vaccine. And I think once we, uh, as long as we don't have a vaccine, people will continue to stay at home more and more, even as cases decline and come down to double digits like they have in China. So that provides a really rare opportunity. That provides a really rare opportunity um, to, <laughs> Sorry, that was my dog. <laughs> that provides a really rare opportunity as far as they already got maybe a bunch of new customers that have not been involved in the online uh, online marketplace before when China was locked down. So now those customers, you know, they gained a new customer share, but those customers still are not feeling ready to go out to brick and mortar stores. So JD should continue to... Uh, see increased traffic and the rate of growth was very high before the correction. I want to say it was like 50% plus earnings and revenue. Um, at least they were guiding that for the next year. I kind of expect them to to keep that rate up at least for another two to three years now because I think they added a whole new customer base and the necessity of this service has, has increased and will be so high until we find a vaccine. So those were two ideas that I was interested in. And then I think I also mentioned lastly, CVS was one that I was looking to get into maybe this week. You know, CVS, like I said, with Uber, you want to find some things that kind of operate within this new environment. I think CVS has come down to a really nice technical level. Um, and I think they'll be deemed as, as uh, necessities as far as what business, businesses stay open because people will still need their their drugs and and their medical supplies so cvs was one i was keeping an eye on plus i think companies like uber eats could come in and deliver their goods so they don't even have to worry about any anything as far as that i think they could either work with the government or a third party vendor like that and they even have some just distribution lines themselves but they're not made for drug distribution more so like doctor and and other distribution products whatever they have but Yes, and also they could turn into coronavirus testing um, testing areas. I read somewhere about that too. So there's a lot of companies that that are, if they're at, if they're, how should I put this? If they are able to stay open, not only is that beneficial because they're able to stay open, but they are adapting to the changing situation as far as how to react to this virus virus event. So I'm willing to take a shot on these, especially if they've gone down, you know, 30, 40 percent, um, because I think their earnings will will bounce back very effectively once this virus situation is is all said and done. So that's how I'm looking to play it. I'm not really looking to do any short term stuff, short term trades, because it's it's just so risky and, and such a volatile market unless you're willing to get out in one day. And usually I like to wait two to three days for a confirmation. Um, you probably won't have much success trading this market in the short term. So it's only yeah. long-term ideas. Got it. Got it. That's a great point. Um, and for the viewers who are watching this right now, so, you know, as Fassel, uh, Fassel mentioned, uh, he's looking at CVS, JD.com, and then Uber. And again, we're not 
telling you to go start buying those, just our um, take on the market. Uh, as per you know, what I'm doing, I'm currently mostly sitting in cash. I'm waiting for the market itself to resolve, either forming a bottom or uh, at least giving us you know, uh, some, some dead cap bounce where I could potentially get into some option puts. I just have one option put remaining for April 24th, I think, um, on the uh, SPY, so S&P 500. Um, and I think that's a 213 strike. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, so far I'm, you know, I guess outside the money, but my option contract was uh, purchased, I think, 11th March or 10th March. So I'm looking pretty good so far. Uh, in terms of short-term plays, I put out an update earlier in community discussion. Uh, I picked up some dollars are longs um, for uh, my Forex picks. Um, again, for those of you who are watching, uh, we're going to start opening up Forex analysis options and oil starting beginning of April. And we're really pumped to start exploring those areas because I think there's going to be a ton of opportunities over the next several weeks, several months, and it will give you something to, to learn in terms of different markets, okay? And especially the Forex markets, I think they're really interesting because you get to see uh, how the, the world itself reacts to these kinds of events, how different currencies become stronger versus weaker against others. I just think Forex is by far an interesting landscape that you know, you guys may want to learn how to trade, or you could simply just watch and learn. Okay, so I'm long dollars are. Uh, I picked up and closed some longs last week on uh, dollar yen. Okay, so there was this one right here. So I closed that up from 107 to 109.7. Um, and then other currencies I'm looking at is the dollar peso because I live here. And I understand how the country is doing. Um, so yeah, these are sort of my short-term plays. And then obviously on top of that, you know, Bitcoin, which crypto is a very big uh, part of our community. For those of you who are interested in joining our community, um, I'm currently shorting Bitcoin. Uh, last few days, I think there was just so much chop that was happening in this kind of movement right here. But I think the... Uh, uh, crypto market, especially Bitcoin, I think is ready to start breaking down. Um, and I'm looking for reclaim levels for Bitcoin around $4,800, $4,300, and potentially back to its previous low that it put in around uh, March 12th, around $3,600. Okay, so potentially any of these levels, you may get some long ideas. And as I've told you guys before, you know, one of the main reasons why you may want to consider Bitcoin as part of your portfolio is because it's essentially a hedge against, you know, the current financial system. Whether you want to believe that Bitcoin is the savior, you know, that's going to come out on top at the end of this all, or if you just think that, hey, I'd rather take a chance on something that's new, that's, you know, not just out there that can be printed infinitely or is a, you know, a hedge against, you know, that the whole financial system as a whole it's an interesting risk to reward pick because what you're really risking is maybe, you know, 10, 20% drawdowns, but the upside is almost, you know, 10 X to 50 X over the next several years or maybe even a decade. Again, not financial advice. It's just, you know, my take on the markets, right? Even though it's fallen so much, um, I still do believe that Bitcoin still has a long way to go. Uh, it's just, you know, an emerging asset class that honestly just came up over the next 10 or the last 10 years. So depending on how it, you know, fares in this whole financial crisis that we're witnessing, you know, that might be um, a fantastic price for you guys to consider getting in on. And then finally, um, I'm focused on watching gold right now. Because usually in recessions, gold does also have a pullback, not because it's selling off with the rest of the market, but because usually it's stuck in the middle of, you know, uh, a deleveraging and liquidity crisis uh, where everyone and their mother is really looking to get into cash and they'll sell everything, whether it's Bitcoin or gold or, you know, U.S. Uh, 10-year treasury notes or uh, equities, commodities, etc. 
So while gold is having a pullback, I'm looking for it to find a bottom somewhere. And when the, uh, uh, when, when gold finds a bottom, I still think that it may have more upside left, even when the uh, equities keep selling more. Okay. So that's kind of my thought process. Any, um, anything you want to comment on, on that fossil? Um, you know, I just want to say one quick thing because we are starting, um, the futures channel. So for those of you who don't even watch futures, I was someone who never really paid attention to futures, but I got to tell you up until this recent, maybe year and a half, two years, the futures market has really been keen on signaling different resistance levels and support levels that affect the market right when it opens or or throughout the day the futures market has really become uh, essential to me in determining some support and resistance levels so if you don't pay attention to the futures market don't don't worry like i never did i never i always thought it was too much of a risky market that that didn't really affect the way i trade but uh i'm really glad that that we're going to start doing this now because as I've seen recently, it really does affect a lot of what happens from from the open to the close of uh, Monday through Friday of the stock market. So uh, keep an eye on that. And I hope you guys can definitely see what I'm seeing. Awesome. All right. Well, I think that pretty much wraps it up. Uh, we covered a lot of information in today's video. Uh, for those of you who are watching, please do hit the thumbs up if you enjoy our content. If you want to leave us a comment, leave us a comment below in the comment section or come join our Discord channel, which is also in the YouTube description. Uh, like I said, we're opening up all these new channels and starting you know, in May, um, if you don't sign up, we're going to start raising the prices. But if you are already a member, we're going to grandfather you in into the uh, current rate. Okay, so I hope you guys come join. Join the Advantage community and um, Hope y'all uh, have a good rest of your Sunday. All right. Take yeah. care and cheers. Everyone stay safe. <laughs> cheers. All right. Yeah. Stay safe. Don't, don't get the corona. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hopefully no one gets corona. Stay safe. <laughs> All right, y'all. Take care.